There has been another Kratom death and lawsuit filed um, in Washington State, uh, and this involves a 2022 overdose, overdose death of a 37-year-old um, man, and again, from the toxic effects of Kratom. Um, and as we had talked about previously, Kratom is um, an herbal supplement, so it's not regulated by the FDA. Um, and because of that, you, you know, you never can be sure exactly what strength you have, what the dosage should be. Um, people use it both as a stimulant and also as like an opioid-like, as a relaxant. Um, and, and unfortunately, again, somebody has died from, <clears throat> from um, an overdose with it. Prioritizing profits. Prioritizing, prioritizing profits. Dangerous drug and product cases. Welcome back. Another episode, Prioritizing Profits, Dangerous Drug and Product Cases. Another week, another show. Here we are. How have you been? How are you doing? How was your New Year's? I'm good, good. I'm glad to be back. We had a little hiatus last uh, last week, but uh, it's good to have you back and yes. back on the air. Um, New Year's was great. Uh, I'm excited for 2024. Um, getting off to a, to a good start so far. Um, we've been actually very busy. A lot of a lot of herdy mesh calls coming in. Mm, yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, some exciting things happening at the office. That's all good. Um, I know you had a, I guess, a good New Year's and, and an unfortunate part of that as well. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was it was a little unlucky. I would say first on the hernia mesh. That's great to hear. Uh, they're coming in at the very end. We won't have those three M cases again where. <laughs> Things settle, and then all of a sudden people realize, oh, wow, I could have a case here. Um, yeah, so New Year's. I mean, New Year's was good. We went out. We did a little bit of a bar crawl. It was fun. Uh, nothing too crazy. I didn't drive at all on New Year's. I don't really leave my house very often, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I like I work from home. I, li I like being home. I like my space. Um, if I need food, I'll either cook it or order it. More often than not, order it. And... Um, I didn't drive at all New Year's Day, New Year's night, or anything like that. And then the next day, New Year's morning, we got up to go uh, get breakfast somewhere. And I like started driving, and I looked, or I heard a sound, and I looked, and my driver's side side view mirror was just off. Like it was just off my car. Uh, it was still there, but it was attached by like, like a, dangling, a dangling, yeah, by dangling a wire. by wires, yeah. And, and I and I went back and I parked and I look at it, and there's no other damage to the car. So, because because with the Mercedes, when you turn off the car, it like tucks in, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. Years and it it's tucks even in. hard to mess with them, exactly, actually. Exactly, exactly. Because if, if it was a car, I mean, they would have to hit it at a very particular angle in order to only get the tucked in side view mirror. Uh, but there was no damage, no no paint scratches or like marks or anything like that. So I'm pretty sure it was, it was vandalism. Someone walked by, some drunken person and... To be honest, after like I looked at the other side and I was like, oh, I, I could see like the entertaining aspect of tearing this oh, off. Well, it's tucked in there, you know, <laughs> just like, oh, I wonder if I just yanked on it, what would happen? Uh, still unlucky, unfortunate. Yeah. So one of the reasons that we did miss last week. And uh, I think, I mean, we, we put out a, a highlight episode and it was yeah. a good kind of like going into season two, I guess, if we want to call it that. The new year, 2024, yeah. our second year of podcasting. So it kind of worked out. Uh, unfortunately, going to have to get that fixed. Yeah. And body shops, I mean, take like two to three weeks to set up an appointment and then another week to actually get it fixed. It's, it's chaos, but we'll, we'll power through. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, it's just unfortunate, but... What can you do? Yeah. Well, let's hop into it. Uh, do you want to start with updates on cases? Uh, well, actually, you had mentioned just earlier about um, a case that's like all over social media and the news yeah. um, that a lot of people are talking about. So I thought maybe we'd kind of jump in with that, which is a really crazy situation um, during a uh, sentencing hearing in Las Vegas. And probably a lot of you guys have seen this. Um, the defendant, like what they call it, Superman. I mean, literally. Jumped. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a big jump. Like, like leapt over. I mean, yeah. kind of like flew over. I mean, it was, it was actually impressive. kind of impressive. Mm -hmm. Flew, you know, um, over the bench um, and attacked the judge who was in the process of, of sentencing him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, that's not something that you see very often. Obviously, that's why it's all over social, social media and, yeah. and all over the news and everything. Um, but just a really crazy crazy situation. I think it was her, her um, court clerk who actually tackled the guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought that's what I thought was the most shocking part about it is 
first of all, you know, at least from what I've seen of like, you know, TV shows and whatnot, there's uh, there's cops there, right? Like there are officials there that are meant to kind of protect and make sure everything's safe. And this guy was able to run across the courtroom, leap over the judge's stand, and there was just like no one there to like protect her. And, and until the, uh, the, the, I don't know, what, what well, actually, it was, her, it was her clerk, clerk who actually yeah, yeah. works for her. Um, Who's like the last person that should be like, <laughs> the, you know, the first person to this scene, right? Like he was kind of like beating on her for a while before someone came and helped. That's very good. Well, another thing too is like court clerks, you know, they're not like, you know, security guards or, no. you know, I mean. They uh, type. Uh, well, yeah, and they usually just sit around a lot. And so most of the clerks I've known have, have not been very athletic, I will not say. Not the most that. physically fit. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. But I mean, he was obviously very loyal and, and jumped in there. But the situation was that he had been released and was appearing. So he, he wasn't incarcerated at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, once she sentenced him, they were going to be putting the handcuffs on him. But so at, at that moment, um, and I guess what happened is, you know, he was in there for attacking somebody with a, with a baseball bat. Oh, jeez. Yeah, the assault and battery situation. And he had this long history of felonies and misdemeanors and just violent interactions and had been arrested a bunch of times. And so he was trying to kind of ask her for mercy and, and, and talk about how he was turning his life around and all of this. But again, horrible, long, you know, uh, rap sheet here. Um, and when it became obvious that she was going to sentence him to jail time, that's when he just like lost it and dove over and attacked her, pulled her hair, knocked her. I think they, they, they fell over and the flag fell over on him. I mean, it was, it was like a melee. It was like really, really crazy. Um, and so she was not horribly injured. Um, I guess she struck her head, but she was okay back at work the next day. Um, I think it was one of the marshals. Um, had cuts. Oh no, no, the defendant had cuts on his hands, and a marshal was hospitalized with a dislocated shoulder and a gash on his forehead. Wow! So, I mean, there are a few people involved in this, and yeah, if you haven't seen it, I mean, you know, Google it. Um, it's it's pretty. No. It's pretty crazy. Um, you know, normally you don't think of judges as being uh, as it being a particularly high risk, dangerous job, but yeah, I mean, I I, I could imagine that because of obviously the nature of the job, right? I mean, you, especially for criminals, you are sentencing people for life at times, and you're dealing with some serious cases, you're dealing with some of the most dangerous people in the country. Yeah. Um, so I, I can see that happening, which is why it was so shocking that there wasn't more precautions, there wasn't more protection or, or anything. And it just took so, so long for people to react. And like, <laughs> I think it's just like stunned, like in shock for a few minutes, like, well, what? Yeah. I mean, I don't think any of them had seen, seen and something like that happened. And I guess, you know, you're right. I mean, yes, the guy had been released, so he wasn't, you know, in custody at that time, hence no, um, you know, no restraints. But at the same time, if you look at what he was in there for and his whole, you know, rap sheet of, you know, uh, violent uh, act after violent act, yeah. he was high risk. Well, I don't even think it should be like, oh, okay, well, we have this person come in, so let's have someone stand guard. No, I mean, this is criminal proceedings. There should always be someone in yeah. between the judge and the the uh, plaintiff or the defendant, I mean. Yeah. Well, there was a marshal there by him. Yeah, he was just out just for coffee, I good. guess. <laughs> You know, he was hanging out, talking to uh, the the female clerk on the other side of the he's, courtroom. He's probably in a little bit of trouble now. I'm I mean, sure he is. Yeah. I'm sure he is. And then I saw a video today as well that um, they re they did another sentencing or another trial for him, obviously with all these additional charges. And it, they, he just got the uh, book thrown at him, right? Because well, I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, the judge was over sixty, and I guess there's extra charges or like the, you know a lot of these violent. Or protected crimes. person, exactly. I think was yeah, term. yeah, yeah, yeah. Protected person, yeah, and they were, and also an officer of the court. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I mean, it, it's not like you know you can come in there and plead about how you changed your way. <laughs> yeah. I've changed my ways of cleaning up my act, which is what he said right before he flew over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as long as you do what I want, I'm <laughs> I'm on my good behavior. But yeah. Yeah, and then. Uh, the pictures of them bringing him in he had like a almost like a dog type of mouth guard thing he had mittens on his hands oh no like silence of the lambs yes kind of yes thing. yes like, like, like everything like he was a psycho killer that you know <laughs> 
<laughs> was on the verge of just going on a massive killing spree within the courtroom. Well, it's probably accurate. I mean, yeah. it's probably. I, I yeah. mean, the last thing that you want is for another instance to happen with the same person because that would just be humiliating at that point, right? Like the yeah. first time it's like, okay, guys, we messed up. The second time it's like, okay, what's going on? You know who you're here? dealing with now. This is like the Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. It's Hannibal Lecter crossed with Superman. So have you heard of anything like this going down before? And, and I didn't realize it was in Vegas, which kind of makes sense, a little bit more sense now. I feel like if there's any, uh, you know, Everything's chaotic, extreme impulsive. extreme and dramatic and yeah, Vegas. Yeah, and, exactly. And, yeah, excess. Have, have you heard of anything this extreme? Maybe not this extreme, but I mean, crazy things like this where there are defendants just kind of out, lashing out mid, mid-trial or during um, sentencing. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't heard of it, like, where they've attacked, a, attacked court personnel, but, you know, attacking, like, you know, the, or even in civil cases, the defendant, um, but not, not where they actually really got at them. Um, lots of threats. You know, I mean, and and definitely there are times where, you know, a judge is sentencing somebody or the, the prosecuting attorney, mm-hmm. they're threatened quite often, um, you know, by the person that they're either prosecuting or they're sentencing them, um, and they're just pissed off. I mean, they, they blame everything on that person who's, who's simply, you know, enforcing um, and applying the law, the law as yeah. opposed to themselves who have committed mayhem and, mm-hmm. you know, a battery and it's attacking somebody with a baseball bat. I mean, this is That's like a not a minor situation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I imagine any like physical crime that doesn't have to do with like a gun, I, I think a machete and a bat, like those <laughs> are as bad as it gets because that's when you're really causing some serious damage there. Um, and it, and it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you've seen the TV series Narcos. Mm-mm. It's about Pablo Escobar and kind of oh, that. Oh, no, thing. I did see some of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, very uh, relatively accurate, right? As accurate as it can get with some of the more historical aspects of it. Um, and there was a period where he was being, you know, tried and, and oh, his, um, yeah. his accomplices or, his, you know, his workers were being sent to court and whatnot. And he was just killing judges. Mm-hmm. He was just straight up bombing judges and killing them as whenever they could, whenever he could or had the opportunity. And so judges were actually showing up to court in ski masks to protect their identity oh my so God. they wouldn't be assassinated the next day. Wow. Insane. So that's kind of scary because I mean, you know, and really most of these things, I mean, the court is public record. So even if you have a ski mask on, and especially somebody who has all of these connections, I'm sure they could get the name of the judge, whether they could see their face or not. But wow. Yeah. I get, well, that would definitely be a downside to, to being a judge. And, you know, I, I mean, you're, you cycle through. It's not like, you know, you're just a criminal law judge. I mean, you're a criminal law judge, mm-hmm. then you, you know, transfer over to family law, then you transfer to civil. So it's not like you can say, okay, I want to be a judge, but I don't want to ever have to deal with any criminals. Mm-hmm. Not an option. So what about, uh, you know, outside of the courtroom? Because I know, for example, Summer is a probation officer, and she'll talk about how sometimes it can be uncomfortable where uh, she'll be around town and she'll see some of her clients. She'll mm-hmm. see people people that she has uh, that's on probation either breaking the rules or that she's you know gotten in trouble before and it can kind of be this awkward dynamic is there any type of safety precautions or do you think judges take safety precautions when they leave the courtroom and you know especially if they're dealing with these high level uh, cases which this isn't necessarily high level but there are ones out there yeah i don't know i mean i think it it would be impossible to be able to provide say all judges with yeah, security of course, yeah yeah um i mean i think it would be kind of kind of nerve wracking. I mean, I know I would, I just was at Fry's the other day and it was funny cause you know, I'm in my workout clothes or whatever, doing some grocery shopping. And this guy said, aren't you that lawyer? I'm like, well, I'm a lawyer. I'm <laughs> that lawyer. Which, <laughs> that Tucson wait, lawyer. Which lawyer you're talking? Oh, that one that's on all of the buses and the billboards. I was like, okay, well I was on some buses and billboards and not really, really recently, but, but it is interesting, you know, because, because certainly that must happen to judges a, a lot. And yeah. I mean, they see, you know, hundreds of people, you know, so, um, and, and I've run into, to judges on a number, you know, I mean, a number of occasions. So, um, you know, it could be, you know, a positive person that had, or for judges, it could be someone that had a positive experience or a very negative experience. You know, Hey, aren't you that judge that sentenced me to 10 years? Yeah. (laughs) By the way, I'm out. Good to see you. That'd be a little unsettling. Yeah. I'll be following you. I know where you live. Mm -hmm. I know who your, your kids are. Yeah. 
Well, that was a really, stuff. yeah. I mean, it was crazy to see. I think uh, hopefully there's some more protections in places in place for judges because they should definitely be protected. I mean, that's like a very respectable role, and for that type of event to happen is insane. Um, and and I wanted to bring it up, or you know, I mentioned it to yeah. you because it was everywhere. It was everywhere, yeah. and I and I started seeing clips of like similar things. Like that. there was one where um, a defendant had been sentenced, and he like leaned over to talk to his attorney and just fucking headbutted him. Oh my god. Yeah. His own attorney. His own attorney. I guess he didn't do him a good enough to go do a good enough job. Apparently. See, I, I never ever wanted to do criminal law. I just never wanted to do it. I didn't want to prosecute. I didn't want to defend. I really? just no. I like I, I like the idea of, of defense. Um I thought you know, I, I think I've always had very much like a devil's advocate perspective. And, the, and, you know, people always say, you know, how can you defend someone that's a criminal or that you know is guilty? But the argument that I always hear is that you want to be sure the rule of law is followed correctly. Absolutely, yeah. And, and no, everybody deserves a fair trial. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, and a vigorous defense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and so a lot of times, and I've spoken to, to criminal defense attorneys also in that, in that regard, and they'd say, yes, I, you know, I know that the person is guilty, or I assume that they're guilty, or I'm pretty sure they're guilty, um, but they deserve, you know, they, they, they deserve the defense, yeah. and we need to make sure, you know, that the prosecutor, that the police have followed all of the rules and done everything correctly, mm-hmm. and if they haven't, um, you know, that, that then the, the case is, you know, it needs to be dismissed, mm-hmm. um, or the so so, and I, and I think it's absolutely you know imperative that we have those protections mm-hmm. um, for our civil liberties. Uh, but at the same time, I also uh, one friend of mine. I mean, he was telling me like these just horrendous you know child sex abuse cases. I mean, you know, with like with babies who had um, herpes in their yes. anus and that kind of stuff. And you know, the person basically admitted they had done these things yeah. and and here you are having to sit in the room with them and, and again everybody deserves the best possible defense um but are these people you want to hang out with are these people you, you don't even want to be sitting at the table with sometimes yeah no i think that's a very scary idea and i know when i was looking into law school and looking into public defense because that's where a lot of attorneys start out right like well they, yeah a prosecutor or a public defendant uh-huh. yeah yeah well and that's how you're going to get trial experience because exactly. those cases you know a civil you might go to trial once or mm-hmm. twice a year a criminal you're in trial pretty much every day and i thought it was so shocking to me when i learned just how many cases public defense have, oftentimes they are meeting their clients for the very first time right before they meet or before they walk into court. Well, for like a hearing. Yeah, Yeah, for a hearing. Uh, and, and and that's so insane to me. And then, you know, there will be clients that have been in jail for months or for years and they're awaiting trial and they don't see their public defender. And it's not because the public defender doesn't want to. It's because they have so many cases and it's such a underfunded area. Yeah, well, uh, it's government. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, government, you're not going to make a good... A good end well... Of. I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of aspects of government are underfunded. Yeah. But then people also don't want their taxes raised. So, you know, it's a balancing act. Uh, I, I would say there's probably areas <laughs> that you could take some. Put well, absolutely. Here, but, absolutely. Uh, either way. Either way. Very interesting. And if anyone has any questions or concerns or probably just like see videos, because I think that's something that is really interesting or I could see being useful for people is, you know, you see some of these cases or some of these juries coming to conclusions. And I know from an outside perspective, even for me, I'll think, how how is this possible? You know, how did this happen? Or how did the jury come to this conclusion? So if there is anyone that has questions on that, feel free to throw those videos in there or uh, send us any of those news articles because I think we would be really interested in yeah, talking about it. Yeah, I'd be interested to check it. them out and talk about it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to get into some updates on cases? Sure, sure. Um, so one of the topics we talked about, it's been a while now, um, but it got a, it got a lot of reactions and a bit of controversy, um, were the Kratom lawsuits. Yeah. And so there has been another Kratom death and lawsuit filed um, in Washington State, uh, and this involves a 2022 overdose, overdose death of a um, 37-year-old man, and again, from the toxic effects of Kratom. Um, and as we had talked about previously, Kratom is um, an herbal supplement, so it's not regulated by the FDA. Um, and because of that, you, you know, you never can be sure exactly what strength you have, what the dosage should be. Um, people use it both as a stimulant and also as like an opioid-like, as a relaxant. 
Um, and, and unfortunately, again, somebody has died from <clears throat> from um, an overdose with it. And last time we spoke about this, obviously we we got a lot of feedback from it. Yeah. A lot of people that were a little frustrated and uh, disagreed, which is fair. Absolutely. How and, and I did see some comments as well where it's like, "Oh, kratom's not dangerous. It can't. You can't overdose on it." Is it, I'm assuming in the toxicology report there was some type of chemical within the bloodstream or you know some reaction in their body that they could directly connect to kratom? Yeah, definitely. It's metragenine. And that's um, the, the toxicology, toxicology report showed um, positive finding for metrogenine. And again, the, the key on a lot of these is that people sometimes use that in conjunction with other um, drugs or yeah. medications or alcohol. Um, and so the stronger cases are the cases where there aren't other substances. And it's clear that this was the only <clears throat> the only substance that could have caused the death. Um, and so that's, again, uh, what the findings were in this case that was recently filed. And as we, we spoke about, I think the last time we had talked about two verdicts, one was um, an $11 million uh, verdict in Florida. This was back in July of, of 2023. And then another Washington state case um, involving uh, a, a father, $2.5 million. So, um, you know, two big verdicts last year. And I think as a result, you will see more lawsuits being filed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I personally haven't used Kratom. I did do my little sleuthing and went into the, the uh, Kratom Cafe yeah. last time to kind of check it out. Undercover. Undercover, yeah. And, and you know, when I asked the guy about it, I mean, he was like, oh, no, no, it's absolutely safe. And one of the claims in this lawsuit is that what this guy had been told was that it was basically like coffee. It was like a stimulant like coffee. Um, you know, but again, I mean, in theory, you, you could overdose on coffee. And yeah. depending on what kind of, you know, how sensitive you are to caffeine. Well, I mean, we've talked about the the cases um, with Panera, yeah. you know, with those highly caffeinated beverages. So, um, I, you know, I understand that some people take this and they, they think that it's very helpful, um, fine, but you have to also realize that because it's not regulated, you just don't know if the dose you took last week is the same dose you're taking yeah. today. Um, and so there, we, we just don't know how that's going to react. And, you know, and again, maybe you're using some, you have other medications too. You know, this guy was using it for uh, pain conditions. Actually, I think the other two cases also, um, you know, back pain uh, issues along those lines. So you probably have some other medications too to treat that, that you've been prescribed mm -hmm. or some other, you know, therapies you're using. Um, and, and again, we don't know how these things interact. So it just, just beware that it can be dangerous. And, and, I think there obviously was a lot of, of controversy, and there's a lot of controversy around this topic of Kratom and the health effects and if it's dangerous or whether – if it's not dangerous, whatever it is. I think everyone can agree, though, that FDA regulation would be beneficial because even the people that are pro-Kratom – I'm assuming they probably want to be sure that whatever they're taking is Kratom and that the dosages are correct and they're able to safely take the, you know, the substance that they're looking to take. When do you think we're going to see any type of FDA intervention here or are we going to? It's shocking to me that there hasn't yet been because this seems like such a blaring red flag. Well, the FDA doesn't regulate herbal supplements. So as long as it's considered an herbal supplement, it wouldn't even be, you know, within the category that they would be regulating it's not a drug that's insane <laughs> and i mean so like weed i guess weed was a scheduled drug so yeah, that makes exactly. it separ separate exactly. and cbd was included and in that's so you can mm -hmm. make it a herbal supplement wow that's interesting so it, that seems like a massive loophole it, does that mean that there's just never going to be any type of regulation around kratom unless it's just completely outlawed well, I think, you know, the last time we had spoken, there was like this organization, it was kind of like I remember a, that. A Kratom, I yeah. forget the name of it, but it was like some Kratom society where they were trying to um, put together a group of manufacturers who were saying that they were regulating. Um, and, and I think that would be one of those things where they're trying to say, well, buy from us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you're yeah. a member of this group that? and that sort of thing. But I mean, it's like that, you know, all the other supplements that we were talking about that you see at the, at the Circle K, all of these, you know, male enhancement things yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Again, those are herbal supplements. Um, and again, they can be dangerous, but they aren't at this point regulated by the FDA. Yeah, that's shocking to me. I think yeah. there's probably a general assumption that whenever you see something on the shelves at a store, 
that there was some type of oversight <laughs> about what it was or what was what's in it and that it's some what's safe to a certain extent. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting too. I mean, we, we've been talking recently about just all of the, the failures within the FDA just regulating what they're supposed to be regulating. So I think that you would have to really overhaul to be able to, to pile an entire, yeah. you know, another entirely new category on their plate. Have them go out of their way to, to regulate something that's not even <laughs> You're in doing so good with all the stuff you're supposed to regulate. <laughs> yeah. Maybe let's you start with what your job actually actually is let's and then that up. Can... yeah and then we'll add some more uh-huh. um, you know so and, and th- there's a lot of issues going on with that right now and so maybe there will be some changes i don't know that this is on the table to uh, to be tossed into the fray or not and and all of these cases are individual cases right they're not yeah. class actions or anything and i'm assuming it is against the manufacturer of these kratom uh, supplements but even there i would assume there's probably some type of loophole or, or difficulty because it reminds me almost of the disposable vapes where, you know, there was Juul, there was Puff and Juul's still around, but with like the Puffs and like these off-brand disposable vapes where, you know, as soon as they went into some type of legal trouble or they're facing any problems, they would just... Uh, what, what's it called? Well, they would go. They would disband. They disband. would. They would yeah, go. Exactly. They would go bankrupt. They would, you know, basically shut down and then and reopen under yeah. a new name and exactly. a different. Yeah. So that's a big issue, and and a lot of these um, are manufactured like in China, and and it's really tough to. How do you regulate? Yeah. That, you know? So so um, the lawsuits are generally they include the manufacturer, but then they also include the store yeah, where it's right. sold, mm-hmm. and and again, reasonably so. Um, they're in the chain of of commerce. They're selling the product. And even more importantly, they're the ones who are advising the person, who are telling them that it's like coffee, that it's absolutely safe. Um, I'm assuming the Circle K clerk isn't going to be giving all of this advice here, but... Probably not the Circle K clerk, um, but, you know, like Kratom Cafe or these yeah. particular, you know, stores that, that crop up specifically for these types yeah. of products. Um, you know, I mean, obviously they're pitching it and talking about all of the, the, the wonderful benefits and... Uh, you know, and and making money on it, clearly. Clearly. Well, I'm interested to see how these lawsuits play out and how the defendants in it kind of recover or, you know, how they deal with it. Because if this feels like such a gray, murky area that I wouldn't be surprised if some of them can kind of slip out and slime their way out of. Well, so even the cases we talked about where there were those big verdicts, again, you can have a big verdict, but that's just a piece of paper. Yeah. But then the issue is, how do you collect on it? And in any of these cases, um, a verdict is going to, there, if, say there's a defendant, there's a manufacturer, and there's also the seller. And then the jury's going to say what percentage they put on the seller and what percentage they put on the manufacturer. Odds of collecting for the manufacturer, like we said, are probably relatively slim unless it's some huge, you know, corporation in uh, in the United States. Um, but in all reality, it's probably going to be very difficult to to collect on them. Mm-hmm. But what may happen is that with enough of these big verdicts and the actual stores getting, you know, getting hit with that the stores may choose not to carry it because it's too high risk. Mm -hmm. And some of these, you know, Kratom cafes and things like that, that are, that that's all they do. um, You know, perhaps those won't survive it. Um, it, They won't be able to get insurance. It's going to, it's going to be tough if they start getting hit with the verdicts. So it may be one of those situations that simply by these lawsuits happening, um, a lot of people may be protected because the products will not be sold as many places. Mm -hmm. That's what I would assume, especially when it comes to like gas stations and like these other off, brand GNC type of places uh, that don't uh, necessarily don't need, need it. To... Right. I mean, they've got a million other things. Yeah, and exactly. if people are dying and they're getting sued on it, um, they don't need that. And so perhaps they stop carrying it. So The Kratom cafes, I think, are going to be a little bit difficult. <laughs> and I would hope, too, if it's a Kratom cafe, that there is some type of oversight or testing or, you know, they're not just getting anything off the street and throwing it in there compared to... Like, you know, like I said, Circle K, I just wouldn't trust anything that I see at the front (laughs) counter and the clerk's uh, medical diagnosis that may come along with that. I don't usually try to get my, uh, you know, get, yeah. get advice from the Circle K clerks. But. Well, that's an interesting one. I'm sure we'll get some feedback mm-hmm. in that yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. And, and and I like seeing feedback. I think it's something that we don't see the same perspective that other people see, right? I mean, someone that is taking this drug and it's helping them and it's not benefiting a drug. Them. It's not a drug. Not a drug. This herbal, <laughs> herbal supplement. supplement. Um, they're experiencing the benefits of it and neither of us have tried it or have any experience with it. We're just simply looking at the court documents and, and mm-hmm. the studies coming out about it. So 
it's all about different perspectives. So. Absolutely. We respect all opinions. Exactly. May not agree with them, but we respect them. <laughs> what other uh, updates you got for us? So, uh, again, this is quite a few, well, quite a, I guess a few, a few months ago, we were talking about the Brazilian butt lifts mm-hmm. and the problems with that. Um, and so, uh, specifically in Florida, this was this an, er- an area that people were flocking to for inexpensive uh, Brazilian butt lifts. And what that is, is where they uh, take fat from other areas of your body, perhaps your abdomen. Um, and then they redistribute it into your butt so that you have like a Kim Kardashian butt. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's become very popular. Um, and so, and of course, it, I think the average cost of it is about $4,500. But some of these places called chop shops, chop. <laughs> well, that wasn't the name of them, but they're referred to as chop yeah. shops, where they're doing like just tons of these procedures. They're doing 10 or one doctor is doing 10 or 12 procedures in a day, Crazy. you know, and it's a several hour procedure. Um, and so it, what it turned Turns out was happening. Well, people were dying, and they were dying from um, uh, PFE, so pulmonary fat embolisms, and that's where um, you, the fat gets injected into your artery or blood into your blood vessel and blocks it. Mm. So people were actually dying, mm. and um, you know, again, you don't think like some uh, uh, cosmetic. cosmetic procedure is yeah. going to kill you, and then especially as they go, that one doesn't sound as scary, you know, sucking some fat out. It's just it fat, you know, it's what, just fat, there's no organs or anything like that involved. Right, right. I mean, it sounds like, it, and so I think most people do assume that it's not high risk and they're not going to die as a result, but people were dying. Um, and we talked about that that problem. And so in response, Florida has actually passed a bill regulating this particular procedure because it's such a big problem. And so this uh, new law went into effect on July 1st. Uh, and, and, you know, there's some, the regulations don't sound that tight, if you ask me, yeah. but um, so new new clinics have to have a health department inspection before being registered. Um, and this one is that surgeons have to meet the patient in person at least one day before their procedure. So previously they were just like... Walk-ins. Well, well not walk-ins, but they'd be on the calendar, <laughs> but the doctor had never even talked to them, didn't yeah. know anything about their medical history, exactly what they wanted, nothing. They just popped in the day of. So they have to meet them at least one day before, which still doesn't seem particularly... In in depth, but okay. Um, <laughs> they can't perform BBLs on more than one patient at a time. They were going yeah. double whammy. Just oh yeah, like- multiple rooms that were going on, and so them and and also um, they can't delegate fat fat extraction or grafting to other staff. So they were having like other staff. Do, doing some of the procedures, and they were kind of over, overseeing it. And these yeah. are not trained people. Yeah. Um, that, and then also they have to use an ultrasound to guide their cannula when they're putting the fat back in, fat grafting. Instead of just going in blind. Instead of just going in blind. So then, and because, and again, you don't want to, if you go too deep, that's where the problems happen. Yeah. You want to kind of keep it more surface. Um, but I mean, you're doing, you've got four rooms with four butts on the table. and There's fat you know, just the- uh, sitting there <laughs> ready. You just come in, you stick the needle in, inject it, and go to the next one. Yeah, I mean, and then you have you know unsupervised staff doing things. I mean, it's just a recipe for disaster, and sure enough, disaster occurred. So, um, so there are these regulations now in place, you know. And but it's not a national law. This is a, a law that was passed in Florida, um, and so you know, chop shops could pop up in other locations, um, and then other states may have to deal with it um, similarly. Yeah, it's shocking that this practice was going on in the first place, that it would even happen at all. You know, all of these things seem very kind of baseline, something you'd expect and you'd hope for if you're right. getting something like this done. I'm assuming they were probably cheaper than the more sophisticated facilities that are a little bit more responsible. Um, well, they were saying, so on these, these were, they were saying they were charging about 3000 to $3,500. Average price otherwise is about close to $5,000. Thousand forty eight hundred dollars So, you know, it's a little bit cheaper. But again, I mean, you know, 3000 to 5000 that might make the difference between whether somebody can get a butt lift or not get yeah. a butt lift. Well, and they don't know the, of these additional risks being attached to it. Right, right. And I mean, I'm sure, I mean, they're not going to be told, well, yeah, I'll be in your, I'm yeah. going to have my secretary pull some fat out. I'll be next door with a different butt and then I'll pop back in here. And, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. I wonder if they're ever sitting in the waiting room and there's just five people there and they're like, oh, you here for an appointment? Yeah, what, yours, what time's yours at? Oh, 4.30? What about you? 4.30? 4.30? 4.30? And you're like, hmm. So, and then just one doctor comes back, pulls five patients back. I feel like that, that would be the first one. Where I'd be like, hmm. <laughs> They'd probably be a little more subtle about how they <laughs> yeah, set that probably. up. But 
Yeah. Probably. So anyway, um, I wasn't really in the market for a Brazilian butt lift, but uh, well, and this... anybody who is, you know, and again, you know, any of these things, you know, research the care provider, research this doctor, find out if they've had complaints and issues, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and get recommendations before you go in there. And where can you get some of these recommendations or reviews? I'm assuming there's no Yelp for doctors. Well, I think there is, but I wouldn't necessarily trust that because I think a lot of those are fake. Yeah. But I mean, again, you can check with the uh, board of medical examiners mm. in your state. Um, and, uh, you know, and you could ask them, you know, for other, you know, some, I mean, again, they, they don't, ha they can't disclose, uh, patients information without their permission, but, but they may have, I mean, a lot of doctors will show you, especially cosmetic physicians, um, you know, they will show you before and afters and they will have people who are willing to speak with you. Yeah. Um, and or even come show you. So. Oh, and it's scary too, that you mentioned this that this is a Florida law that's being put in place, which means that in other states, all of these things are still possible. These corners yeah. can still be cut and you can still have these risks associated with it. Yeah, I guess Florida was just like a, a, the place where everybody was going and it was kind of becoming known as, yeah. you know, the, the butt lift capital or something. Yeah. <laughs> so the butt lift capital is going to have to move. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned too about it being a Kim Kardashian butt. Like that is the description that's kind of like the qualification of it. There's been some pictures going out of Kim Kardashian having just a much smaller butt. Like it looks like she got downsized and people were sh not only shocked but almost upset because she was the one that kind of led this entire culture of you know big butts big boobs -donk -donk. just fit yeah you know like just all of these plastic surgery and having a very tight waist like just this uh what's that what's that one cartoon character she's she's a um redhead and she is a dress and she's from like the looney tunes and oh, Jessica Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jessica Rabbit. Just like absurd yeah, body proportions. Yeah. Well, cartoonish. I mean, not yeah, like exactly. a normal human being. And Kim Kardashian kind of made that popular. And then all of a sudden, now that that's like the norm, it's what everyone has in it. And it's so common that people are cutting corners and making it as cheap as possible. And now she's going back the other direction. Well, never going to. Well, and, and I, you know, and again, I have no idea what she did or didn't do to her butt, but uh, there was a lot of speculation that she had a, actually had implants as opposed to mm. um, fat injections. Maybe she had both, who knows? Um, but yes, but if, if it's now gone, that would su su suggest that it was more of an implant that could be removed yeah. as opposed to the fat that now you've moved there. And I don't know how you get rid of that. Yeah. I don't really know how all that, I mean, like breast implants, I know how that works, but like butt implants, there's not like, there's like openings there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't necessarily want to get into it either. I feel like that would just be a very uh, rough surgery to go through. Well, you'd be lying on your stomach for a long time, I think. I so. can't sit on it. Well, uh, I'm glad that there <laughs> is some regulation going in into it. Uh, unfortunately for the floor. Floridians, they're not going to be known. Floridians are not going to be known as the highlight of um, Brazilian butt lifts no, any longer. Well, I know. Uh, what other updates you got? Okay, um, back on the social media scene, um, there was a, a pretty big development in a case in some cases against Snapchat. And Snapchat um, has been used um, for drug dealing quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, which makes sense because it's one of those things where it'll disappear. No. Um, and so there was a complaint filed um, in Los Angeles, and it involved the families of 11 children who had obtained uh, drugs through Snapchat, and they were laced with fentanyl, and these children all died. Um, I think some of them were like... 14, 16 years old. I mean, really sad, sad stories. Um, and the family sued Snapchat saying, you know, that, that, um, that, that basically it's a digital drug market was how they're kind of referring to it. That, um, it, and, it, and so social media companies are protected um, from uh, suits based on third-party uh, content. But mm -hmm. what they were saying is it's not about the third-party content or what this person did. It's about your systems, the way that you're, you're, you're set up and like the algorithms with the other ones yeah. um, that have allowed this to happen. So mm -hmm. we're not saying that we're suing you for what the other people did. We're suing you for making it easy for these people yeah. to access our children 
and sell them drugs that then killed them. And so the big turning point in this was that, of course, a motion to dismiss was filed, uh, and they were arguing that this is not a case that, you know, it's not a viable claim. We can't even, you know, basically it needs to get dismissed right now. We don't need to do any discovery. No, it'll never get to a jury, blah, blah, blah. And the judge said, no, this is going to move forward. Wow. We do think that you have set up a claim. And again, not the third party content, but um, your system and the way that you run this, which, and and the knowledge that it's being used in this way and you're not protecting our children. And, and it's another one of those things, too, where the parents can't supervise because they can't see what's on there because yeah. it disappears. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that That I, I see that angle. I see that angle where they kind of have set up this infrastructure that makes it very easy for nefarious activities to mm. go on on there, you know, very discreetly. That's kind of been the biggest selling point of right. Snapchat. You know, even growing up when it, when middle school when that came out, you don't send pictures through text, right? Like that's just kind of weird. And and texting can can be boring. And especially you know, emojis adds a little bit of that nonverbal communication. But through Snapchat and those pictures adds a lot more nonverbal communication. It's something you just it's very quick and easy. Um, I'm surprised that a lawsuit like this hasn't happened for like Facebook or. Uh, Skype, Telegram, uh, even just like iMessage on iPhones. I mean, I would assume you could take this angle with a majority of messaging apps. Well, I guess, uh, and, and I don't understand all of the details of them, but for example, like with, with a text um, or a chat, it doesn't disappear. You, you can, can delete it though. Well, you could delete it, but it still is somewhere out there in the ether you could find. Same thing with Snapchat. Well, they're saying it's not and that that's, or that... There, there, there is. I've seen, or I've, I've read about, um, like cases or criminal, not not studies, but like investigations, criminal investigations, mm-hmm. where they can take your phone and they can go through and subpoena Snapchat. Those, those, all the messages. I mean, through every platform, right? Like every app tracks everything and keeps track of everything. Snapchat's no different. Um, there, I think they're a lot more private with it, right? You're going to have to get a subpoena. Mm-hmm. But if you if if there is law enforcement that is looking for those messages, mm-hmm. they can definitely get their hands on it. Yeah. Well, I guess what they said that that the features that set apart, apart from other apps are um, automatically deleted messages, geolocation functionality, mm-hmm. and the My Eyes Only privacy feature, and that they are saying those make illegal activities harder to track and are especially attractive to drug dealers. That makes sense. The My Eyes Only. So there's store. I don't know how familiar you are. Uh, not at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not at all. So with Snapchat, you can create stories where all of your friends or your contacts, people that you have added can see your story, but there is a for my eyes only uh, Snapchat story or for friends only Snapchat mm-hmm. story where you can kind of pick and choose who sees the story. You have a public one, maybe you're out at dinner, you post that, everyone can see it. And then if on the side you're slinging a little bit and you want to say, hey, I got this deal going on, you can pick specifically who you know is going to be interested in those type of advertisements and then um, only they can see it. I think uh, to my understanding, you know, what, I, what do I know about, deal, about, about dealers on, on Snapchat? I hope you don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think people are leaning away from it. Uh, same thing with like Venmo. Venmo, I know, has had a lot of issues with that as well, where people were receiving payments for you know illegal drugs or illegal just items in general through Venmo because it's just so easy right like and and it can be any amount compared to having hundreds of dollars in cash you can just send a few buns and they will track and and kind of see if you're consistently getting these um I guess suspicious consistent payments in certain amounts or especially if someone puts in like the description for marijuana, for cocaine, then your your account's going to get banned pretty quickly. I've actually seen people do that where they put the little leaves and things, but oh, I mean, yeah. it's legal now. Snowflakes. So. Oh, I'm, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Yeah, there's a few. Fine. There. All right. <laughs> it's, it's legal now, but it's legal. The snowflakes are not legal. No, that's not legal. Yeah. But uh, still, I mean, you can't be slanging on the streets. That's still illegal. So. No, but if like I picked up some gummies for a friend and then she was paying me back and she put... That's illegal. What? I'm pretty sure it oh, is. Oh, it probably is. Yeah. Okay, well, I haven't done that. No, yeah. Hypothetically, if <laughs> hypothetically, that... <laughs> if, hypothetically, if I happen to be at the dispensary and... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's or, that's yeah. interesting. So how, how exactly does it work to where there's these families? And, and there's a several families, right? Yeah. How many was it? 11 different children are combined in, the, in mm-hmm. these cases. 
And I'm assuming it's essential for there to be several cases coming together because Snapchat is massive. Yeah. I mean, that is a massive multi-billion dollar social media company with a ton of power. Oh, yeah. Um, it would be essential for there to be a lot of these cases. And they all, I would assume, have to be pretty damn strong, too. Yes. And, 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 and again, you know, this was the very beginning. And so there's 11. In fact, I think there was initially eight, and then they added three more on. Um, and, and at this stage, since it has gotten past, I think, and as people hear about about it, there may be more cases that come forward and many more joining in. I mean, it's kind of like how a, an MDL would, would get started. I mean, this yeah. is in Superior Court, but I mean, you know, ultimately there could be an MDL mm -hmm. along these lines um, if there are enough people. Um, and I mean, with, with all of the issues with fentanyl, I mean, there's so many, you know, I don't even know what the, the numbers are ridiculous about yeah. the number of deaths on a daily basis. Um, and I think there's probably a good chunk of ones that are sold over social media. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there probably are a lot more cases out there. And since it has been determined that this case is going to move forward, that it's viable, I think we'll see more people coming. I'd imagine it's very intimidating taking on a company like Snapchat, especially from a law firm's perspective. Right. Uh, what is that like taking a case on, and especially being one of the first few where you see the potential here, you know that it's going to it has a potential to be a big one, but it's going to be a lot of work. You're going to have to put a lot of cost up front. There's obviously a lot of risk associated, and then you also have to find several other clients or hope that they're out there, right, and reach out to you to kind of bring everything together. What is that like from the law firm's perspective? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And it's and it's um, actually in the answer, which you'll probably be like, oh, yeah, is so these meetings that we go to, like American Association for Justice, mm -hmm. Mass Towards Made Perfect, that sort of thing, all of these firms from around the country come together at these meetings. And a lot and, and one of the issues that people will discuss is what's up and coming. And they will have multiple firms get involved. Because uh -huh. again, taking on, say, one, you know, one firm taking on a huge corporation is just not feasible. I mean, yeah. it would take all of your resources, all a, of your yeah. time. You couldn't do that. But when you take, you get like five law firms. Or big ones too. Yeah, some of these really big law firms. And then they, they can allocate a portion of their resources. That makes sense. A few attorneys. And so, and again, the loss isn't as big either because a lot of times these cases do get dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage yeah. like this. And so whatever they've invested up front is gone. But again, mm -hmm. if you share that among, uh, you know, several law firms, it doesn't sting as bad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and the work is... Is, is less and and it also you know, then you can compete with one of these huge corporations because you have you know 50 attorneys on our side not five right yeah. that makes <laughs> and, sense and and as they get bigger you might have a thousand attorneys right yeah. i mean some of these mass torts you know there are attorneys all over the country that are getting involved, some to a greater and some to a lesser extent. Yeah, power and numbers reminds me yeah. of the scene from Planet of the Apes where he has one <laughs> stick and he's like monkey alone break and then a bunch of sticks you monkey together strong <laughs> <laughs> I like Something. that. I'll we'll have to pitch that at, yeah. at, at, at Mass Horse Made Perfect. I can see that all the attorneys yeah. monkey together. Strong. And you can't <laughs> break it. Yeah, maybe we can get Fernie throw up a clip of that. Oh, that, that's funny. Um, yeah. Well, I, I am looking forward to seeing how that plays out because they are really at the core of this attacking one of the biggest value propositions that Snapchat has mm -hmm. is the kind of privacy, the secrecy, the, the limited time thing. I mean, that is what makes Snapchat good. That's what makes it appealing to... Uh, to, to the younger generation. But in this case, that's what they're saying is the problem. But I mean, why, it, it, why does everything have to be so secret and so private unless there's a problem with it? Well, it's not even that. It's like if you send a if you send a picture or a selfie, you don't – sometimes, you know, you, especially if it's a funny one, like maybe I'll send Christina a funny filter. I don't want her to be able to pull it up whenever she wants and show it to her <laughs> friends, especially if you're in like middle school or high school, right? Like bullying is super yeah. big and, and when it's just like a quick picture or like, you know, maybe you're, just at, you're, you're nervous, hey, do you like me? But you don't want them to screenshot it and send it to their friends. Snapchat's a safe place to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. But I, I mean, and maybe it's just that I've never really figured out Snapchat and so I've never used it and haven't. I think the biggest thing, honestly, is like I was saying with the nonverbals. I don't like texting, but I will Snapchat uh, all yeah. day if I need yeah, to. you do a lot of Snapchat. Well, not that much, honestly. I Snapchat Christina because she likes to Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like being on my phone very much. But uh, I know definitely in like the early days, like in college and whatnot, when you're in that early just talking phase with someone 
texting can be very difficult and straining, always having conversation. You can talk to someone, but not actually need to talk. You yeah. can just send them a picture of what you're doing. And then well, it's a little bit more personal too. And it's really, it's immediate. It's like right then what you're doing yeah. right then. And how long do they last? So you can set it. You can have one, well, it, it pops up and you click it and you can set it so it's one to 10 seconds, or you can have it where uh, it just stays up until the person clicks off. But once it clicks off, like once the, the picture's gone, it's just gone. Okay, so that you only get to see it once. You can't go back and look at it yeah. again later. Yeah, exactly. And if you screenshot it, it lets the person know that you screenshotted it. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same thing with the messages. Messages, you can you can set the settings where it's like it deletes after 24 hours or it doesn't delete at all um, or, you know, after a certain amount of time, whatever it is. And then same thing with that. If you screenshot it, then then it tells the other person. Um, and that was always something that like, I remember being in middle school and, you know, you're texting someone and it's like, you're, you're telling them you're like them or you're talking about something personal. You're like, oh my God, what if they like show this to someone? You don't have to worry about that if you use Snapchat. Okay. All right. Well, I've learned a lot and I guess we'll just see, uh, see where this goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, uh, what else you got for us? Okay. So on cases that we're handling, and we'll just be um, somewhat brief on this, but um, we've been getting a lot of inquiries lately on breast implant cases all of a sudden, and I'm not sure really what it is, um, why there's this uptick. Um, but I wanted to just touch on those again and kind of, um, you know, go over the, 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 the brief details on them. Um, it's a very specific um, breast implant that's been recalled, and it's the Allergan brand. And the problem is it's a uh, very rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that it's causing, um, and it's called BIAALCL, um, which is Breast Implant Associated Anaplastic Large Cell Lymphoma. So there's actually a lymphoma that is, in the name, is breast implant Jesus associated. Christ. Basically, it's caused by, yeah. you know, Cancer caused by breast implants. Um, Very serious condition. Um, It is not breast cancer. It is a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so these these implants, they were recalled back in 2019, but um, the average time from implant to diagnosis with this condition is nine years. So even though they haven't been implanting these things since 2019, um, you're going to, on average, you would see people, say they got them in 2019, that the year they were recalled, you could still be seeing people on average developing the cancer up, up to like 2028. 20, yeah. um, you know, and again, um, that's average. It might be a little bit longer, it might be more uh, sooner. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it's been that there are, you know, if the reason is there have been more diagnoses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't seen a lot about it in the news. This, this is an ongoing um, litigation. Yeah. We are definitely still taking cases. Um, and, and again, these cases will still be viable. They're, the time frame would be from the time of your diagnosis or when you knew or should have known that you have suffered damage, yeah. i.e. gotten this condition. Um, and so, so there are a lot of them out there. And unfortunately, we'll still continue to be people getting diagnosed with this, uh, with this condition. And, uh, and I am assuming as well with this diagnosis, since it's very specific, it's non-Hopkins lymphoma that is caused by breast implants, unless they are being misdiagnosed, uh, as long as it, as they're not being misdiagnosed, then it's pretty clear what the cause is, which, you know, obviously this is an unfortunate situation, but yeah. it is good that there is kind of that direct correlation there because we yes. do have a lot of cases where there's serious disease going on that comes up years later and it's incredibly difficult, if not nearly impossible, for the everyday citizen to make that connection. Yeah, to figure themselves. out what it was. Yeah, these they should be, um, and again, they, they they should be asking about the implants. But um, the 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 um, symptoms be important to look for are swelling in your lymph nodes. Um, I mean, it's not real real specific things, and again, it's not breast cancer. Um, so if you have swelling in your armpit, your neck. Um, people also suffer from loss of appetite, um, generalized fatigue, fever, night sweats. This is very broad. I mean, this is like another yeah. day for me. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm tired. I don't. Eat very and there much. might be a mass or pain in the area of the breast implant, okay. so you don't have yeah. <laughs> any of those kinds of things. I think I'm safe. But but again, if you if you do have implants, um, and you know if you're not sure what types of implant you have, you can contact the doctor who yeah. uh, who implanted uh, to to confirm that. And you know if you have any of these symptoms, make sure that you get them treated as soon as yeah. possible, like with any type of cancer, early diagnosis, early treatment is really critical. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting too, that this is the second cosmetic, 
uh, surgery or cosmetic kind of lawsuit that we have going on here. You know, we had the Brazilian butt lifts originally, um, and then now there's the breast implants. Luckily, with the breast implants, it's very specific to a certain brand, and it's not necessarily just some rogue doctors going out of their way to just be very reckless with their practice. Not just a rogue, con- rogue company that uh, yeah, <laughs> developed yeah. the breast implants, you know, and and took took their sweet time getting them recalled, but yeah. uh, but they finally did uh, in in uh, at the pressuring of the FDA in 2019. And so we are taking these cases and and it's good to hear too because I think there always is this this concern of statute of limitations because it's it's so in the air it's hard to say every case is different, every state is different with their restrictions, but with this very specifically it's you know once you're diagnosed and then, and if you're misdiagnosed then that doesn't start, right? Like if you find out you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma but let's say your doctor isn't familiar with a specific type um, but and then you find out two years later that it is that specific type and it is directly correlated, then you're still... Okay. Well, it would it depends a lot on the state, um, okay. and you potentially could have a claim against the doctor. Um, mm. But again, that's going to be state-specific. So it's, you know, and, and statutes of limitations are yeah. state-specific as well. So it's really important to, you know, as soon as you do find out that you, that you get in touch. Um, but, you know, we have had people say, well, I, I got these implanted in 2016. That's a long time ago. But you didn't have the condition. You didn't have any damage mm-hmm. until you, until it turned out. And not everybody, presumably, who has these implants will ultimately get this disease. Yeah. So, you know, you might have never had a case. You get the disease. Now you, Now that's when your time starts to run. It's when you knew or should have known um, that, you know, that you had a problem. And is it known what about these implants is causing this? You is... know, it's actually not. That's the crazy thing is they really don't know exactly why. They think that it, it, it's... Um, it, they're textured breast implants, and they're thinking that maybe that's why. And yeah. they, they made them textured because it was supposed to, you know, uh, I guess attach better. Like the scar tissue was supposed to form and hold it in better. Okay. Oh, you're getting queasy. <laughs> well, I just, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't really know much about breast implants, but I guess it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, well, there's some smooth or textured. So these okay. are primarily the textured ones. Um, although I guess there have been some cases with the smooth ones. So they do not know exactly why, but they do know that, that um, you know, it's happening to people who have these implants. And are there other textured breast implants from other companies that aren't having this issue? I don't know about that. Yeah, um, I would, not be, that I'm aware of. I, I think it would make a lot of sense if it was just like everyone was smooth and then all of a sudden one comes out <laughs> to try to stand out and say, hey, by the way, we're textured. Yeah. And, then, and then now there's issues attached to it. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it is... Um, that, that these did come out and were textured. I just don't know if there were other ones that were mm-hmm. as well. And, and Allergan's a huge company. So again, you know, it may have been some really small manufacturer and you don't see the numbers that you see with Allergan. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's so unfortunate. I think with the cosmetic procedures causing these issues, especially because, you know, like we said, with the Brazilian butt lift, that's something that you just assume there's not going to be any serious risk or serious damages. There's no organs being involved or, you know, any problems along there that you would assume. Uh, and it's so unfortunate that, that it, it's causing lifelong damages, if not death. Well, yeah, that, that one's ca- actually causing death oftentimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, if anyone is having uh, issues with their breast implants or they have that breast implant specifically, definitely recommend getting that checked out. Go see a doctor. Make sure that uh, you don't have any other risks that you may have not even realized quite yet because those things, I think, do kind of hide for a little bit. Um, It takes time to really figure it out. But like you said, it's important to find it as early as possible. Definitely. Um, We are kind of coming to a close. I feel like the show went pretty quickly. Well, we can't close without without one more story. Yeah, yeah. Because this one, and I, you, I, I think you will appreciate this, and we have been talking about butts, but this one was really crazy that was in the news this week, and that is um, a, a Florida man who is suing Dunkin' Donuts over severe and long-term injuries caused by an exploding toilet. Exploding toilet. Yeah. So here's the crazy thing. I mean, this, you know, you see this and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to read about this exploding toilet. So then I started digging a little bit deeper and I was like, wow, toilets can explode. I mean, this is apparently not uncommon. Um, and there's a variety of reasons that they can, um, can explode. But this particular situation, this poor guy goes to a Dunkin' Donuts, goes into the bathroom, toilet explodes. He comes out covered with debris, including human feces and urine. 
Jesus Christ. It's <laughs> like toilet paper hanging over his head, too. I know. You could just like see this. I mean, if you can have well, it. So he goes in and it explodes. Is it like he sits down and he flushes the toilet? At first, I was thinking this is just like an extreme bidet, right? Like you sit down <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're two feet in the air and there's a water stream underneath you. Uh, this seems a little bit different where it's like almost a sewage line problem. That's, that's just. Yeah. So, and, and it, it didn't specify exactly, but through my research, look, there were a couple of different things that could happen. Um, and one of them is a situation, again, with the, the lines backing up and it can just start spewing out. Um, and this one, well, the Duncan employees apologized and said that they were aware of the problem and they'd had previous incidents involving the same toilet. So, which, which really puts them on the hook. Oh, that's I mean, just like, te- yeah, that's terrible. Huh? <laughs> Last week we had a guy come out covered in shit. We right. didn't think it would happen again. That's our bad. <laughs> but I mean, here you are, you're like, you know, stop into Duncan on your way into the office, pick up a donut and a coffee. And next thing you know, you're like covered in feces and yeah. urine. And, and you still really... have to go to work. So you just oh. roll up covered in <laughs> shit. Sorry, guys. I don't know what to tell you. I had a tough day at Duncan. Well, that'll ruin your day. But uh, yeah, so the, so the lawsuit was saying you know, that they didn't adequately um, maintain the toilet, they didn't inspect it, and they um, and they actually had noticed that it was a hazard to, to customers. Um, and they didn't specify exactly what his injuries are, but that he has um, is requiring some mental health care and counseling as a result of the trauma. I'm not surprised. That's fair. PTSD-like man. symptoms. Well, yeah, I mean, and you think too, I mean, PTSD, I mean, you have to like sit on the toilet regularly. And, I, I mean, hang out on the toilet. What are you doing? Oh, yeah, my toilet. colonoscopy or my what's the gastroenterologist or whatever, he uh-huh. tells me I got a five minute limit. <laughs> five minute limit. If you're there longer than that, you gotta get up because you don't actually have to go. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've never anyways, anyways. That. I see the PTSD. I mean, I would assume if this sounds I mean, pretty extreme, right? Like there's yeah. shit flying everywhere. You got a lot of crevices that can get into. That's getting ah. in your nose, that's getting in your ears. I mean, and the sense, oh God, I mean, the taste of it. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and this, it's, I, you know, as I was kind of researching this, because it didn't say exactly what happened, I'm like, well, how does a toilet explode? And um, I guess there were a few years ago, there were a bunch of toilets that were recalled. Um, it, it, some of them have like this high pressure system and the tanks can explode. And there were some cases, uh, you know, where somebody's sitting on the toilet and the tank explodes. And, you know, that's like really heavy ceramic yeah. and people were getting lacerated. Exactly. Exactly, shrapnel. Yeah. So, um, is it so? Is it literally like the toilet is just exploding, where that that material's flying everywhere, or is it that there's so much pressure and the shit and piss is flying out of the toilet? where it's, you know, supposed to be going down, but instead it's just going up like a fountain, like a chocolate fountain. <laughs> well, again, I don't know exactly in this, but it sounds to me like the latter would be the situation that happened at the Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Um, but that there were a lot of toilets that were having the former yeah. where the tanks were exploding. Um, and so then I like went on to some, some uh, plumbing websites and they were talking about, you can have like what's called a water pressure wave. Um, you can also have like a faulty plastic seam weld. I mean, th- I, I was like, there are a lot of things that can happen that can cause a toilet disaster. And I'm like, you know, why do I need to hear about these more often? And and uh-huh. and what is what do we need to do to maintain our toilets? I mean, I have never like regularly maintained a toilet. I mean, if it starts running, you know, you have to fix the little bobber thing in the tank or something. Um, and then I've had, I mean, actually, I don't think I've ever done much maintenance other than that to a no, toilet. I've had quite a few clogged ones, but... Uh, you know, not much you can really do there. A few times I've had to call a plumber. There's just you know, nothing I can do about it. But yeah, I, nothing to that extent. That's why I'm very adamant with pooping at home. <laughs> I think that's a very common thing. Not many people like to poop out in the I wilderness. Don't care. Well, well, it's not the wilderness, but like at restaurants. I mean, I would restaurants. Poop at a, yeah, at but a if you're driving, donut. like I'm not shitting at a Circle K. That's barbaric. <laughs> oh my god! You're kidding me? No, circle. What if, yeah, how, what if you're far from home? Well, then I look for a QT. Oh, okay, QT, not Circle K, and, and not Dunkin' Donuts. The QTs, no. well kept. There's been times. There has been times I've I've gone to the bathroom at Circle K, even if it's just a piss. And there's been times there's a thin layer of liquid on the ground, <sighs> and there's nothing you can do, right? You just go in there, piss. You got to get it over with. But uh, to hang out, no, no, no. But oh, also uh, truck stops. Truck stops are good because they got to keep it up. And it's like one of their biggest value propositions <laughs> you know, for, for truckers driving by. Uh, well, I didn't know that I needed to be worried about toilets exploding. So that was news to me. And I felt like I needed to share that with you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I wonder, too, when that happens. It's like 
if you if you're if you clog the toilet out in public, you don't want to be the one that goes up and says, "Hey, by the way, I kind of clogged your guys' toilet. You got to send someone in there to deal with it." I wonder if it's kind of a similar situation with this, where shit starts flying everywhere, spewing out, and you're like, "Is this my fault? Did I do something wrong? Whose poop is this? <laughs> you know, like, who's gonna deal with this? Is this my problem?" Uh, well, I, you might be able to if 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 you're not covered in it, you could slink out. But I mean, if you're if it, yeah, you know, if you were like the final straw and you're covered, I think it's pretty obvious. God, but... I just can't even imagine sitting there as oh, well. You know, God. there's sometimes you like take a big one and like the water splashes up, and that's uncomfortable. I can't imagine unknown feces flying at you. Well, it's not even like you know you could just immediately hop into a shower or something. No, like you're driving home. You're like oh, in your car. And yeah. Well, I'm assuming the ambulance was called. <laughs> Well, there has to be some type of like health risk as well, right? I mean, there's disease and uh, bacteria. I, I don't know. I, yeah, well, I, I, it's hazard. Yeah, hazardous. Right, material. biohazard. Ha- has, yeah. That's a well, whole Well, it's like, remember one. the plane? They had to like actually land oh the plane God. when the yeah. guy pooped down the aisle. Yeah, I think, was it wasn't a guy or a woman? That oh, was I don't impressive. even know. Impressive. Absolutely impressive. Just a solid stream. It looked like, cho- cho- uh, what was it, Chocolate Factory, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, oh, okay. the, the chocolate stream going down, oh. but in an uh, airplane. Also, speaking on airplanes, oh, I don't know if you heard about this, Boeing has uh-huh. a massive lawsuit going on and their stock price plummeted because while they're in air oh the plug the the door flew off yeah so it was like a plug that uh was defective and so the door flew off really yeah okay. i didn't yeah. know what the reason was well and then i saw that there was some investigation going on seeing if there was any issues and it came out that there was a lot of like loose well, nuts and bolts and yeah. other shit going to, on yeah to the company actually that made the plugs and they've grounded those i think it's max nines wow. um and so i know it's like alaska airlines and and i think maybe it's i don't know if it's i think united um, but I was actually kind of relieved because I just am flying out on. I usually fly American. And I'm American like, okay, they always. don't have the Max yeah. 9, so we're okay. They're not. I like ma- American. I feel like there's a lot of um, airlines that just don't do it very well, aren't the best with customer. What is it? Delta got those lawsuits because of all the canceled flights. Oh, that was Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, Southwest. they were slammed. Yeah. Spirit yeah. is absolutely miserable as well. I've never That's taken terrible. Spirit. Yeah, I don't do it. It's yeah. not worth the risk. <laughs> it's great prices, but it's not worth the risk. Terrible experience. Anyways, um, that just reminded me of, of that other potential lawsuit, maybe. You know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, nobody was seriously injured, luckily. But I'm sure, you know, again, mental distress. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, I'm nervous about flying anyway. And after having that experience, that could really, you know, affect your willingness to get in a plane again. Yeah, yeah. I saw someone joking about it on Twitter. And obviously, I'm on like crypto Twitter. And someone was asking, like, is it insider trading if I'm on an airplane and the door flies off and while everyone's screaming and crying, I sell put my it, stock. <laughs> I, I put in my uh, in my my noise resistant earphones. I pull up my phone, go to Robin Hood, and put some shorts on Boeing. Is that insider trading? Obviously, the market hasn't reacted because it's ongoing right now. But uh, I am in the plane, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't think that's insider training because you're actually experiencing the the, the situation. <laughs> yeah. You're not like you know part of the company that has secret information. I mean, this information isn't secret. Yeah. At that point, it's public information. Well, as it's going on, it is pretty secret. No, it hasn't hit the markets yet, right? Like there hasn't any news outlets. You, you are <laughs> not an expert in that area, I but uh, interesting question. I could, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my guess is that you probably could could do it, and and uh, after that, you maybe you deserve something. Um, was there any other interesting cases in the news that you wanted to touch on? Oh, I think we can save them for next week. We've uh, gone uh, gone a little bit over. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate everyone for tuning in and hanging out with us today on this fantastic episode. Thank you for bearing with us last week. Obviously, I had a little bit of car issues. We were able, thank you, Fernie. He was able to get a nice like highlight reel out of some of the big cases that we're focusing on. Um, if anyone has any questions or concerns or comments, definitely throw it in the comments section wherever you're watching this, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Snapchat. Like, Snapchat. <laughs> I don't think we're on Snapchat. No, not quite yet. That's a good idea, though. That's a good idea. Um, we'd love to hear from you, and especially if it's any questions, even if it's not necessarily personal injury related, any type of law questions, we can do the research, due diligence, and, and get those answers for you. And maybe it's something you don't necessarily want to put out there in the public. We also have the email email podcast at showeredlaw.com everything there is uh completely private you can keep it anonymous everything and 
uh, answer some of your questions or maybe talk about some of the experiences you had as well. Uh, hope you guys had a good time and we'll see you next week. Prioritizing profit. Prioritizing, prioritizing profit. Dangerous drug and product cases.